I'm Lori Steinke. I have the honor to be the president of Reason, the rationalists, empiricists, and skeptics of Nebraska. Our mission is to promote critical thinking and science advocacy, and we are rationalists. <laughs> and as rationalists, I thought that it was appropriate that we take a moment tonight to remember our fellow human beings who have recently been killed in hate crimes. This has been a horrible week. We have had people killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We also had two people killed at the Kroger's in Louisville after someone did not find entrance into a black church. So, as rationalists, as many of us atheists, a moment of prayer isn't really appropriate. A moment of silence seemed very akin to prayer. But we are all humanists. And I would like to remember these humans who have lost their lives by reading their names. Maurice Stollard. Vicki Jones, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Melvin Wax, Daniel Stein, Irving Younger, Rose Mallinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Joyce Feinberg, Richard Godfrey, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal. Tonight we're going to hear from Sue Crawford about patterns and predictions, the midterm election. And afterwards, I'd like to invite all of you to come out to Goldberg's with us, and we can um, brainstorm a little bit about what we can do to stop the proliferation of hate in our town, and what we can do to promote <coughs> inclusivity here in Omaha. Sue, as I think all of you know, is a state senator for Legislative District 45. Yep. And she is also a professor at Creighton. Sure. And I will turn that over to you. I can give you a longer introduction, but I can let you read it some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I always have a plan B when I have technology. And so my plan B was to have printed handouts in case the projector didn't work. But of course it works lovely, it's wonderful. But since I already used the paper and the ink to produce these handouts, I'm gonna go ahead and hand them out. So, and that way also, um, if those print is too small for you to see up here, you'll be able to have it right in front of you. <laughs> So thank you, I have somebody else with that job. So, um, as, as she mentioned, I um, am in the state legislature, but I also, my day job is a political scientist at Creighton, and my talk tonight is much more with that hat on, um, with the political science hat, um, I'm not really, not my legislative hat. And so I just wanted to show you a few um, patterns and talk a little bit about um, different ways that predictions are made um, for the midterm elections and share some, some of those insights with you. Now, right after I agreed to do this talk and gave the title, Patterns and Predictions, a good friend of mine, I saw him at an event, and he said, you're out of the prediction business now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, probably if I were wise, I would be out of the prediction business. But you know, we just, as political scientists, we can't, we can't control it. We really still are looking for patterns and, and expecting to be able to make predictions. So I'm gonna talk about patterns and predictions um, and whether or not those are, those are what we see this midterm election is something we have yet to see. 
So a good question is whether or not this election is so different that it will look different than past midterm elections. Um, but I'm going to show you what we would expect and talk a little bit about what people are expecting um, given the, the models and ways of predicting that we've had in the past. So one of the most striking patterns that we talk about with midterm elections is this pattern. And if you look through, this is your first um, slide. It's a lot of numbers, but basically here we have um, every, every midterm election clear back to 1862, right? And whether the party is, whether the press party holding the presidency is Republican or Democrat, you see a consistent pattern here that in the midterm election, the president's party loses seats almost always in the House. So this is a, one of our persistent patterns and something. So we would expect um, to, to see the, pres the Republicans lose at least some seats in the House that would match this pattern. Now, when we look at what causes a president to lose more seats or fewer seats, some of the variables that we tend to look at are how is the, the economy doing? Well, the economy is doing pretty well right now. Um, but another factor is the president's approval rating. The president's approval rating is in the 40s, 40s. And so the last time that we had president approval rating in the 40s, see if I can my mouse will work here, um, is here in 1994. And that's a loss of 54 seats. And you can see in 2010, loss of 63 seats. This was right after the Affordable Care Act, and the Affordable Care Act became a huge part of the election in 2010. And um, several Democrats lost seats in that election. 94, wasn't that Gingrich contract for, with America? Yep. Time frame? Probably, yes. yeah. Yes, it was. Good. So you can see there are a couple of exceptions um, to that pattern. But for the most part, this is a pretty persistent pattern. So a couple of, there are four different political scientists who come up with models, four different groups of political scientists who come up with models and, and for the midterm. And they use what they, what they expect in terms of um, um, the loss of seats. And they, again, they use these other variables, including uh, including the presidential approval rating and how the economy is doing. And some of them use some polling data to come up with predictions. And um, right now, there are about 24 more Republican members of the House than Democrat. And so um, in order for it to flip, it would have to be more than 20, a loss of more than 24. Um, so of those models, um, Abramowitz modeled this in early September 2018. And his prediction was that the House would lose, that the Republicans would lose 30 seats in the House. We have um, a prediction that was made in July 2018. And that model, there was a prediction of a loss of 27 seat, Republican seats in the House. And then we have um, two other political science models. And both of those, one in August 2018, and both of them were done in August 2018. And in both of those models, they, they are predicting a minus 44, or a drop of 44 seats. So all of, if, if the political scientists are right um, in their predictions, then we would expect to definitely see a shift in the, in the House from Republican to Democrat. So let's see what some other patterns in the electorate are. Um, this table shows you the pattern and the difference in turnout in presidential elections and House elections. And you can see in, um, in House elections, the, in midterm elections, the turnout is much lower, generally. And this is one of the things that we'll be watching as well. There's a lot of discussion about this being a, an election that has mobilized people. Um, there's conversations about the millennials being mobilized in this race. So one of the things that we're We'll watch to see if it impacts the, the outcome. Is whether or not this is a this is actually a midterm race where you have more people turn out um, than usual. One of the interesting signs here locally on that front is that actually the um, election office has said that they have had more new registrations in this midterm season than they had in the last presidential season. 
So, I mean, that is, um, I think, an interesting sign of, of mobilization. Um, and so, again, let's see, uh, a lot of the models um, are going to predict um, turnout rates that are similar to our past turnout rates down in the 30s and 40s. Um, um, and this chart just shows you the similar difference and just shows it to you in a, in a picture form as opposed to the, the um, table showing you that big difference all across from 1916 to 2016, um, a, a difference in turnout between um, presidential elections and midterm elections. Again, so we would expect somewhere down here in the 30s to 40s, if it's like an other uh, midterm election, if instead it's an unusual election, we might see something with a turnout um, much higher than that. It's to be seen. Yes? Have you seen any data yet as to whether the registrations are up uniformly across the, straight, uh, across the state, or is it concentrated in certain areas? That's a good question. I, I haven't seen any data on what it is across the state. This is just what was reported. Yeah, I saw a report tonight on the news, and it was kind of Douglas County specific. So. Right. Right. Good question. So when we look at, I'm going to show you a, a few patterns that have to do with political participation. This impacts will impact um, turnout, who votes, um, and some of the some of the factors that we look at when we um, look at whether or not people are going to vote. One of them is that whether they're interested in the election. And interest is a key variable. Another is efficacy. And so we have two kinds of efficacy that we look at. One is internal efficacy. And that is someone feels like they know enough to be involved. And so they feel that they can, they understand politics enough um, to know how to make a difference. External efficacy is whether they think their vote is going to make a difference. So whether, what, the external environment. And so both of those factors, um, the higher you have interest, the higher your efficacy, um, the, more, the more you are likely to um, vote. And as a final variable, the one we're going to look at the pattern on, is the personal investment and the outcome. Um, so how much do you care about whether how the election turns out? And this is over presidential elections, but again, just showing a pattern, again, looking at several of these slides, I wanted to show you a pattern over an extended period of time. And you can look and see, in terms of the percent of people who care who wins the presidential election, yeah. and you notice that that's going up. So there's uh, talk about people being more apathetic, but in terms of care about the presidential election, um, that's, those um, are going and heading in the direction of more people caring about how, who, how the presidential election turns out. Sue, I have a question. Yeah. Do you have any notion as to what those, how this data was sourced? It's going back to 1952. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Whether this is telephone polling That's a good question. or after That's hand or. Thank you for asking that question. So most of the, um, this table that I'm showing you and um, the tables that I showed you, the, the, turn, the turnout tables, let's see. This table that I'm showing you right now um, comes from the American National Election Studies. And this is a, a political science study that we do um, every two years. And so this data comes from um, a pretty in intensive effort to, to make sure that you're um, getting reliable data. Um, and with follow-up calls, et cetera. So this, is, this should be more reliable than the average polling data. Because, um, uh, again, it's done by, a, by a, a group of political scientists trying to make sure we're getting good data over time. Um, so I'll try to remember in the future to say where the data comes from for the other slides as well. Um, the turnout is public data, so we don't have to worry too much about return rates or anything for that in terms mm -hmm. of the turnout. Those are exactly. just public feelings numbers. Are, are but feelings, feelings are another thing, yeah. right? So um, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> now, this is actually from Pew Research Center and is based on registered voters. Um, and it was done in um, September 24th to October 7th, 2018. 
And so a um, couple of different things we might look at. The, the title, you can see one of the things that, that Pew Research Center um, was pointing out was the young voters are less likely to say that it, matter, it really matters who wins in Congress. So uh, if caring about the election is something that drives turnout, um, we would, might be expecting in this election to see a similar pattern that we see in other elections in which the millennials um, show up, don't show up um, to vote in very large numbers. And you see here, the 65 plus super voters are also super carers. So uh, they are persistently you know, really caring about um, saying it matters who wins Congress. And so also, if you think about um, in general patterns, often the higher the turnout rate is, the better Democratic candidates do. Um, if you get more millennials turning out, that will impact the race in terms of um, supporting the, the Democrats. Um, if the millennials don't show up and only super voter, older voters show up, then um, it's probably, and it's, and it's a low turnout race, it's going to be more likely to be more Republican uh, in the uh, results. But one thing I thought was interesting on this slide um, was looking to see if there was an enthusiasm gap or a care gap between people who are supporting Republican candidates and people who are supporting Democrat candidates. And actually, if you look, this shows that no real enthusiasm gap or difference between those who are supporting Republicans and those who are supporting Democrats for um, Congress. Similar levels of, of sense of care. We care about what's going to happen in this election. And the, in both parties there. And not much of a gender gap either. But this is also saying when we look at just the plain top line total, that fully a third of our registered voter base thinks Doesn't care. That nothing's going to make a difference. <laughs> so. And, and also, yeah. yeah. Also, this doesn't have likely, likelihood of voting. No, this is just do you care? This is asking about care. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and scary. so we have, yeah, it, of the people who support, or support a, a Republican candidate or Democrat candidate, um, three quarters of them say it really matters which party wins Congress. Um, and so, and again, as, as you, as Doris pointed out, the, um, in terms of the general population that was, that was surveyed here, this is registered voters that was surveyed. Um, of those registered voters, six, about two thirds say that it's going to really matter which party wins Congress. Seeing a difference between the parties. Now, one of the other factors that impacts political participation is mobilization by political actors. So, do you get contacted? So, how many of you have been? contacted by phone or text or somebody showing up at your door. Within the last 10 minutes? <laughs> Within the last 10 minutes, right. Repeatedly, right? Now, does it feel like that's happening more than in the past? I feel like it's happening differently in the differently past. Differently than in the past. I think that that's, I think finally the candidate um, or the campaigns are recognizing that Telephone polling doesn't work because robocalls have trained our population not to accept, not to answer calls from unknown numbers. Yeah, and so so you see more canvassing. Yes. Um, canvassing is going door to door. So yeah, we're using that term. Um, so um, this slide shows you the number of people again. And this is from the American National Election Study. So this is from the political science studies done by universities and trying to get reliable data over time. Uh, shows that climb in actually the parties contacting people. And I think what we've seen is um, really both parties now learning that canvassing really matters <coughs> and that how much that contact the voter matters and really mobilizing that. Um, now somebody was talking earlier about um, early voting and if you are tired of being texted and called and canvassed, one thing you can do is vote early, turn your ballot in early. So, and then, then you'll get off the list for those people who have, um, can't keep their data up to date, right? Not, not guaranteeing, you know, a few people have printed off sheets and they're just gonna use their print off sheets, but those people who are up to date, uh, it would get you off of their call list and mail list. So, really a striking rise in 
the mobilization of parties and parties actually contacting people individually, um, trying to get them out to vote. That coincides with the enactment of the Do Not Call list, which provided an uh, exception for political activity. So, even even though yeah, that's true. Um, that it, it provides an exception to that, but I, so I don't think that that would necessarily um, mobilize more contact. I think both parties, again, um, have, are learning of seeing the, the impact that contact has on turnout, um, and and so both parties are learned that and are using that. Now, what the the race, the midterm race, one of the. Um, that we're looking at, a lot of it has to do with Congress. And so one question we might look at is congressional approval ratings. And this um, comes from Gallup. So this is Gallup data um, over time to show you um, congressional approval rating over time, the percent who approve of the job that Congress is doing. Um, and you can see it dips down pretty low in, in 2014. You can try to think about um, what was happening in 2014 um, that might have led it to dip so low. Um, and now, at 19%, still a pretty low percent of <laughs> approval rating. So you compare that, we said the president has about 40% approval rating, and Congress here has a 20, 19% approval rating in the last Gallup measure. So this is over a long period of time. Um, and you can see it started at 30, and um, it's gone up and down. Peaked here in 0204, and then comes back down again. Now this is over just the last two years, and I'm sorry, this part, the dates here got cut off. This is January 17, and then it's every other month, so six per, and then it goes to September 18, and this shows you the difference in approval rating between Democrats, Independents, and Republicans um, in terms of approval of Congress. So this is that same question and also Gallup data uh, in terms of how do you approve the job Congress is doing. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, Republicans are more likely to approve of the job Congress is doing than Democrats, and we've got Independents somewhere in the middle. Uh, but still, 30 is not resounding um, <laughs> approval rating. So it's still fairly low in terms of people's sense of what's going on in Congress. And we can see and this is done more frequently than the other Gallup polls. So you can see peaks and valleys more. And you can see, you know, it's, it's possible for Congress to get a decent <laughs> approval rating sometimes. But it stays down there around, uh, among Republicans in the past two years, it stayed down around one third. Uh, 30 uh, 30 approval rating. Now, one of the other patterns that we tend to look at in political science is we tend to look at re-election rates, and what you see this is House re-election rates, and you can see that over time, um, this is from 1964 to 2016. You see um, that over 80 percent of those who run for office get reelected, and quite many years it's over 90% of those who are incumbents who choose to run for re-election get elected. And we can see a dip here in 2010. That was that year that we saw such a big drop in Democrats. Uh, that's a year when it, it drops lower. Um, and so it's an exceptional, 2010 was an exceptional year in terms of incumbents not um, winning. Now. One of the interesting patterns right now is, um, again, this is incumbents who choose to run again. So um, one of the interesting patterns is that there are twice as many Republican incumbents who have chosen not to run than there are Democrats. So there are about 44 Republicans who have chosen not to run and 20 Democrats who have chosen not to run. So it's nice. So again, it's, there's more turnover than you expect because people choose not to run or decide to run for governor or you know, my house members decide to run for Senate. And so there's uh, more turnover than you would expect given these re-election rates. Um, yes? But what, what, what's schizophrenic about this whole thing is if there's only a 30% approval rate or less, 
Why? Why? That's, that's, that's the question. That's the question. Your congressman is bad and mine is good. So, so let's see. <laughs> you're, you're, giving, you're giving away, you're giving away the, the punchline here. So. That's all right. That's all right. I, I expect that from critical thinkers <laughs> all the time. And so I'm fine with that. <laughs> so you can see in the Senate, the re-election rates are, are, are much lower. Um, still, here's 80%, so still um, most of those who are running for re-election are getting re-elected, because um, this is about where 80% would run, um, but it's not near as certain and that you'll win re-election as the Senate as it is um, if you are in a House race. And in terms of thinking about party dynamics in the Senate right now, um, um, it's, uh, most of the models, those political science models that I talked about for the House, um, those models expect some uh, Republican gain in the Senate. And in part that is um, just because we've got, um, uh, I think, 24 Democrats in the Senate um, who are up for re-election. And many of them were elected from more Republican states in 2012, and they had a good election season in 2012, and they got elected then, and now they're up for re-election. Um, and so people, um, the predictions, political science predictions, expect that um, there's going to be uh, probably, a, a, if anything, a gain of Republicans, a small gain of Republicans in the Senate, at least. So here's kind of this question that we um, um, are talking about again. Well, and we've had approval rating and this is another way that Gallup asked that question. Tell me whether or not you think the following political office holders deserve to be reelected or not. How about most members of Congress? And you look in um, the pattern over time is in the 20s. So the uh, pattern here, 26% think that most members of Congress deserve to be reelected. And 68% says that they do not. So, not uh, even lower than the approval rating. But when you ask about your own representative, which is the mm -hmm. pattern you saw there, right? Ask about your own representative and about 51%. That's what it takes to win 51%. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, people tend to have a much more favorable view of their own member of Congress than they do of Congress in general. And, and they only let you vote for your own. They don't let you vote on every, other people's members of Congress. So uh, this is part of what's behind. Um, and so one of the questions is that we talk about in political science is why this disconnect between um, incumbency re-election rates and overall approval of Congress. We have you know, incumbent advantages like name recognition, you, if you know somebody's name, um, then you're more likely to vote for them. Credit claiming, the incumbent can claim credit for things that have happened um, in the district. Personal expertise, they can, they can claim they have an ex expertise advantage. Again, and when you're looking at your own Senate, your own member of Congress, as opposed to the members of Congress as a whole, some of these factors are going to make a difference in terms of causing people to have a higher uh, approval rating of their own member uh, compared to other members. So it's easy for a single member to blame bureaucracy or blame big government um, and, and to identify them as somebody who's working against that. Um, Casework is work that members of Congress do for individuals. Um, so this is uh, things like solving problems and so that gets you um, getting, get, get you approval from some of your constituents and other constituents tell the constituents about what a wonderful job that you know, the member of Congress did in taking care of uh, their social security check or uh, making sure that there was a letter of rec recognition, letter of recommendation for the Air Force Academy. Those kinds of things um, are part of what builds loyalty. We have frequent trips home um, to, to, to visit, to campaign, so especially in the House, you're just always camping. And so um, we you know, expect the senators are a Tuesday, Thursday club. So they, and so they're home every weekend um, and spending time campaigning. And incumbents have a, what we call a franking privilege. They get free mail and use that mail to just contact constituents. 
so that's another piece and part of why people, um, why individual incumbents have higher ratings and rankings and themselves as, as opposed to Congress at large. And another reason why incumbents win is they're expected to win, and once they're expected to win, they're more likely to get money. So um, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle um, in terms of becoming difficult for challengers to raise money to have an effective race against a, an incumbent. And because the incumbent has all of these advantages and name recognition advantages, um, it really takes more money to challenge than it does to run as an incumbent. So the challenger really needs more money and it's more difficult for the challenger to get money. So here's, now we're going to look at some um, party and um, ideology patterns. Here is um, the partisan voter index score and these are based on presidential voting. And so you can see this whole swath of Republican voting for presidential elections, but it, they are scores by congressional district, and so the expectation is that um, the congressional district may go the direction of the presidential vote unless there's something extraordinary that happens. And so you can see um, there's a lot of a lot of um, space, a lot of area that has become Republican. You can see why um, it's easier for the Republicans to hold the Senate and why it's easier for the Republicans to win in the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot, of, a lot of real estate, right? Um, the Democrats have more densely populated areas, and so there are more, there's a better balance between these two than this map shows um, in terms of number of people. Mm -hmm. But this just shows you that extensive um, space that's um, more Republican. And it's based on um, the election, the last two presidential elections, and what the difference was between the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate. And so that's what the, the numbers are based on. So this one um, is looking at percent of registered voters who say that each is a very big problem in the country today. And so this is uh, really just a slide to look at patterns and what issues matter the different people in the two parties. And this is part of looking at really some of the division in the two parties. And you can see that there's quite a difference between the people who support the Democratic candidate and the people who support the Republican candidate in terms of which issues that they care about. Um, climate change, you have 72% of those who support the Democrat candidate think it's a problem. Only 11% of those who support the Republican candidate think that that's a problem. Um, we were just talking about gun violence. You can see 81% um, of those who support the Democratic candidate think that's a problem, whereas only 25% of those who support the Republican candidate think that's a problem. And um, I think as you go down, you can see in, in many issues, there's quite a gap between the two. Um, but some exceptions. Not very many exceptions. The way the US political system operates is somewhat similar between the two. And both people who support both candidates have a concern about violent crime, drug addiction, the deficit. Those are things where there's a little more shared concern about those two. Now, one thing that uh, you'll see here, and I think you can see this in the president's strategy in terms of trying to mobilize the president's base is illegal immigration. You can see that only 19% of those who support the Democratic candidate think that's a problem, whereas 75%, that's one of the higher numbers in terms of the Republican concern. If you look at the percent who think any of these things are a problem all up and down, I don't think there's a higher one for Republicans than this, illegal immigration. And that's pretty striking when you see that. Yeah, there's 13 issues that are winning for Democrats, and so, about five that are winning for Republicans. That's an interesting count. Mm -hmm. that's a good, interesting count. And so one of the questions is which of these issues become salient mm -hmm. in an election, a particular election? Yeah. And um, the 
uh, discussion about the caravan and um, talk about an executive order um, are all trying to make our efforts by President Trump to make illegal immigration more salient in this election because it's a winning issue for them. Um, and so we see uh, that's what's behind a good part of what's behind that strategy. You can see that that looks like that's a, um, an issue that you would want to become more salient if you were a Republican. And you can try to see um, which are issues that you would want to see more salient if you were supporting the Democrat candidate, gun violence. Um, is important, and the affordability of health care. And we have seen the affordability of health care being an issue that um, Democrats are trying to make a very salient part of this race. And so you see ads um, um, talking about from, Democrat, from Democrats or people who are um, supporting a Democrat candidate, you'll see ads talking about the Republicans and their votes on repealing the Affordable Care Act. Um, and the concern that has about pre-existing conditions or affordability of health care um, and our own and in your own um, congressional race here, um, affordability of health care is definitely an issue that um, Kara Eastman is stressing as one of her candidate as one of her core issues, trying to make that uh, a, a relevant, salient part of the race. Yes. It's interesting. I haven't seen anything about taxes on here. That's good. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. And I'm surprised to see that, that the entry for ethics in government is um, so highly ranked by those who support the Republican candidates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Just because I, I, I'm not seeing much in terms of public protest of unethical yeah. Well, that's, that's their candidate's fine. <laughs> You're probably that may, be, right. that may be in part, no. um, but also don't see it. But you do you do see over a majority of Republicans having the support the Republican yeah. candidate having that concern. Um, I the overall economy doesn't seem to be here, just like taxes. Yeah, existing. yeah. And it does get talked about a lot. Federal, huh? That's right. But you know, if the areas that are ripe for coming together and having crossover and having agreement yeah. would be the affordability of health care, affordability of a college education, drug addiction. Yeah, anywhere that the gap is right. relatively narrow. Or where, where one of us is, is 50 close to 50%. Right. right. So yeah. I know there's some interesting patterns there, yeah. some yeah. interesting issues and patterns and differences. And again, this is the percent of registered voters who say each is right. a very big problem um, in, in the country today. And I don't, it doesn't say that they made them rank them or anything. So, no. so they could have said multiple problems were a very big problem. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't the bottom ones of illegal immigration, those numbers should be swapped? No. Um, actually, if you'll see, the, the 19 is a blue number. And so that's the Democrat. 19% yeah. of the Democrats think that illegal immigration is a big problem, and 75% of the Republicans, Republicans think that it's a big problem. So overall, in uh, part, um, the Republican, the person who supports the Republican candidate tends to think fewer of these issues, they're on most issues, mm -hmm. they're on the left, thinking that fewer, a smaller percent Think each of these things is a problem, um, and many and many many of the issues, with the exceptions being the drug addiction, federal deficit, and illegal immigration, and terrorism. Where there's a difference. So your Republican is yeah fear fear issues. You can see um, are are more likely to be seen as a big problem for those who support the Republican candidate, and many of these um, issues up here. Um, are ones where it's very difficult to mobilize or get attention to that issue by those who support the Republican candidate. Just one example of some of the polarization or difference between the two parties right now. One comment I would make is on that federal uh, deficit. It's like the Republicans don't care about it if their person is in power. But if they're not, <laughs> So this was taken really caring. It's a matter of using an excuse. Yeah.
Yeah, and this was taken in 2018, this fall, yeah. September to October 2018. Um, and so, again, um, mm -hmm. they, they, there wasn't a question that asked how you would balance tax cuts and the deficit. That would be an interesting um, piece to parse out if, if there's consistency there um, or inconsistency. If you just get to pick any problem and you don't have to make choices between problems, um, then um, it's easier to talk about the deficit as a problem if, if you have to ask whether which you would choose, if you would choose to get rid of a tax break or um, choose to raise taxes to address the deficit, you might get interesting, you know, different responses. So again, one of the um, one of the factors that we often hear people talk about is sorting and, and how a concern that there's more self-sorting in our political parties and political groups now than in the past. And I do remember when I was uh, way back when, when I was an uh, undergraduate in political science, we used to talk about one of the advantages in our political system was there was a lot of cross-cutting cleavages. And so it was the case that the religion and um, uh, with the exception of, of uh, um, African Americans being more Democrat, it was the case that across different social categories, you would tend to have a mixing of the two parties. Um, and now there's talk about um, how there's more self-sorting into di if different groups. And this, this table just shows you some of those groups that are pretty highly Republican on the, um, your left, your uh, right-hand side, and highly Democrat um, on the other side. And you can see um, the difference in terms of gender, religion, you can see um, some sorting of groups that tend to fall into one of the, one of the other party. Um, and we were just talking about the millennials, and here they are down here, tilting pretty heavily to the Democratic Party, um, over a little, barely over half, um, tilting in that direction, but much more than the percent who identify themselves as Republican, which is only about a little over a third. And here we see the uh, silent generation. Not, it does tilt Republican, but it doesn't tilt as, as far as you might think. And so you can see um, some dif some differences in, in the Southerners and, and white voters versus some of these groups that are on the side that tilt Democrat. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, a few slides where we're looking at ideology as opposed to party identification. Uh, yes? I, maybe we're going to get into this later, but uh, it occurs to me that uh, blacks who are very largely uh, Baptist, religiously unaffiliated, Jewish, and Hispanic who are very largely Catholic, that all of those on the Democratic side could be called non wasps whereas on the left mm -hmm. side, you've got white evangelical and Protestants. 68% Republican. Right. So the, the WASP culture, of course, has been the dominant one in our society. Only two presidents weren't WASP. Uh, or, Joel, of course, me, three if you count Martin Van Buren as, as, <laughs> as a WASP, even though he's Dutch. <laughs> Not Anglo Saxon. So, so a lot yeah. of the anxiety comes from the WASP, the dominant WASP the culture. Power on this, yeah, on this side. So let me, I'm just going to give you our political science definition of ideology um, as we're looking at ideology. And with that, we're looking at the systematic way of thinking about the proper purpose of the scope of government um, when we're thinking about ideology. And um, what we expect from political science is that it's slower to develop and less likely to change than a party ID. Um, this more um, underlying sense. So you could be a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican, um, perhaps. 
And what we tend to do is we tend to measure it on a seven point scale from very liberal, liberal to very conservative in mud and bar studies. And just, excuse me, is yeah. that self identified or is yes. that on the basis of okay. Yes, that's, that would be self identified. You ask people, how do you identify yourself? And so um, it may, how, how people identify themselves may, may or may not follow these basic principles that we tend to talk about when we talk about, in political science about what those different ideologies mean. Um, but we tend to focus on liberalism. The notion about liberty is a freedom to do something. You know, you're empowered to do something, um, often in part by um, uh, government action to empower or government action to prevent somebody from preventing from um, preventing you from speaking or exercising your freedom. Uh, but it's a, very much a focus on positive liberty and and the importance of equitable distribution of social resources. Um, change is valued, value of community. Now, so this is what we would say is a summary of the, ten, of the tendencies of someone who would consider themselves as liberal. Um, and again, but the questions that we're going to look at are self-identification, emphasizing diversity. Whereas conservative on the other side emphasizes a negative sense of liberty or freedom from um, government. And again, government leaving people alone to make their own choices. The private sector is solve, to solve social problems and wary of change, wary of taxes. Too much government undermines the competitive spirit or is a danger to traditional moral values. These are um, values assumptions about the world that someone with a conservative viewpoint would often have. Those assumptions about the world and how the world works. So. Number two seems to be changing. Uh, free and from government, but we wanted to enforce our religious views upon people such as dealing with uh, folks of uh, different sexual preferences or abortion or Right. Yeah. And when um, someone who is a conservative talks about that issue, of, um, like let's say sexual orientation, when someone who's a conservative talks about that, they're going to talk about it as a religious liberty issue, mm -hmm. and they're going to talk about it as the case that we don't want government to tell us who we have to serve in our, um, who we have to serve or who we have to hire. And so, I mean, so, so that their, their frame on it is a liberty frame um, in terms of thinking about that issue. But it's their liberty. Right. Yeah, right. Correct. Right. 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 The Koch brothers, yeah. brothers famously held a get together, I think it was in Nevada, that was uh, invitation only, reporters right. weren't allowed, but the right. message, you know, information leaked out of what the, what the, uh, what the goal was. It's always stuck in my mind because that's when that's when they define freedom in, from the conservative viewpoint. It was freedom from two things: taxes and regulation. Mm -hmm. So that, that's their definition of freedom: mm -hmm. freedom from taxes and regulation. Freedom from freedom from. Mm -hmm. So again, this is what we assume um, that are assumptions that people are in and viewpoints, views of the world, that uh, someone who has a conservative ideology would hold. Excuse me, one more thing. <laughs> um, th this one about uh, too much government undermines the competitive spirit. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, one of their assumptions, but as a factual matter, I'm sure you're familiar with the study that was done at Harvard, a transnational study that showed that nations with generous safety nets, social welfare benefits, have more entrepreneurship because, and they use the analogy of a tightrope walker. If you know there's a safety net to save you, you're more willing to take risks, such as starting a new business, because you know you're not going to end up on the street homeless. Right. So the corporations aren't necessarily interested in small business. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have more corporate capital rather than mom and pop so yes, these are assumptions. They're not necessarily grounded in empirical fact. Okay. 
or reason. Okay. Right? Ideology <laughs> and reason are not necessarily. Um, <laughs> um, in both cases, this is this is the way you think about the world. And that can be very sticky. We tend to think about that as very sticky in, in terms of um, the assumptions that people have. It's very difficult to change someone's assumption about one of these sort of core principles with facts. So it, you know, it's, uh, if somehow, if you have to get them emotionally involved in the issue um, to consider changing some of these assumptions, it's very difficult to reason with someone on one of these core assumptions. Emotionally just facts. So it's, it's more difficult, I think that, you know, as a, somebody who's in the education business, um, the cognitive science about how difficult it is to get people to change, to learn and change their perspectives is, is quite daunting. Um, yeah. So one of the interesting trends that we've seen, uh, an interesting pattern that we've seen, is a shift in ideology and, the, and what ideology looks like in our um, electorate. So when I was learning about voting models and ideology, this is what we saw, and so this is what we learned about. We learned about the median voter, and the median voter being, and that most people were in the moderate, were moderates, and that you just had more um, uh, people with more consistent ideology um, at the tails, and fewer people who were consistently liberal or consistently conservative, and most people having a mix of liberal and conservative ideas. Um, um, some talk about people being inconsistent. You know, that few people have consistent had consistent views, and it tended to be a mixture. Um, of liberal and conservative views, and more people here in the moderate direction. And you see in 2014 um, that it's still the case that this median voter, that more people are in the middle, um, and if you're trying to win a race, you want to get closer to the middle um, to win that race. And so we talked about that as the median voter theory, that the closer you are to the middle, the more you're going to get, if, if you're going to get, if you're right here, just to the right of the middle, you're going to get everybody on the, you're going to get all of these folks that are far further out there because they're going to pick you as opposed to somebody who's further left. Um, but you want to, you wanted to get to the middle to get the most voters. And now in 2017, you see a very different shape of the electorate. This is very different. Um, and when you actually have more people in the two ends as opposed to at that middle, the middle is no longer the high point, and the middle is no longer um, where you see have the most people. And so you are seeing people with sorting more um, and being more consistently liberal or consistently conservative. Their views are being reinforced more, and it makes sense with some of the conversation we're having about self-sorting and people also with people listening to um, news outlets that match their ideology um, probably is helping to make them more consistently liberal or consistently conservative than before. Sue, what does it mean that the median is in this, in the, the figure in 2017, there's much more room on the x-axis on the consistently conservative side than there is on the consistently liberal side. True, it's, there's a but, narrow but the, range of belief. the median is the, the median number of the people. The middle. Yeah. Right. So there are uh, the same number of people who are consistently liberal and consistently conservative. And you can see that on the liberal side, it's a shorter, shorter hump, but it's much higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the, the um, conservative side has more variance in it. Yeah. And the liberal side is more consolidated. But, but it's been fairly consistent in the, how far away from the median the bottom is. And now the median of liberals aren't, very, aren't as far from the median as the cons consistent conservatives are. They're stashed in the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, where, that's where all those really freaky conservatives mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, You see, it uh, goes further to the right and still a, yeah. Not a, not a huge peak, but you've got a peak way out here. Right. 
to the right, and the liberal peak is here, closer to, and that's high, higher than what the conservatives are at that similar distance from the median. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I read a deal about Europe, and they said that there are no true liberals in America, that there's, there's left-leaning moderates and conservatives and right conservatives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If they were stable food, then they're countries. So this map puts the party identification um, on and looks at ideology by party identification and where the median Democrat is and where the median Republican is. And you can see in 1994, um, there, there was a difference between the median Democrat and Republican, but it was not far, and you still had um, more people in the middle than at either of the two ends. And by 20, 2004, still, the middle is, is um, holding fairly firm and there's, um, or the median Democrat is, the median Republican is. And you see a quite different, striking difference in 2017. The median Democrat and the median Republican now are quite far apart. And here, you can see liberal and conservatism by party. So you can see this peak here, fairly far out on the Republican side. The median Republican is not out there at that peak. Mm -hmm. uh, the, median, the median Democrat is kind of right at that peak. So uh, I noticed that uh, the big change happens between 2004 and 2017. Yeah. Is a lot of this due to social media mm -hmm. and just like how we're I think that's, with each other? So uh, the social sorting argument suggests that part of it is the social media and other media outlets, cable news outlets that allow people to listen to only you know the news that supports your um, ideology is part of it as well. And people are talking about self-sorting, even geographically, people living in different places um, in part because of they feel more comfortable living there because of the ideal, dominant ideology there. So, so more reinforcement of, um, of your ideology by the social media and, and cable media and perhaps your neighbors. So I have then I have a few questions uh, so we can look and see where we might be seeing polarization or greater polarization um, between Democrats and Republicans on some of these questions. Um, and you can see um, whether or not the person who say government should do more to help the needy, even if it means going deeper in debt, um, that's something where you see this, um, it was always higher by the Democrats. Um, but you see a stronger polarization between the two parties on that question. Um, and percent who say people have a hard life because governments don't go far enough, um, again, the polarization the increase in the Democrat movement. And um, quite difference. And the, the one that I think is interesting in terms of a shift is the immigration. Mm. And the percentage of the immigrants strengthen the country because of their hard work and talents. Um, uh, really, back in 2006, we've got a pretty shared agreement on that. And then by the, but now, um, uh, uh, quite a difference between the parties on that, on that issue. We don't have one here that says who's more interested in giving more money to the rich. Like the no. <laughs> no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the environment is also one where, is one of those issues where you see a growing polarization difference between the two parties. Yeah. The environment over time. Seems, seems to be the one where we're actually going in divergent right. directions, and some of the others were going the same direction with different speeds, but that one market is going 
Except for Indian Americans. Yeah. <laughs> so, Now, one of the arguments about polarization is that actually the polarization in the public has come after polarization in Congress. And that we see, um, this is how often the parties are voting different from one another in the House versus how often they're voting different from one another in the Senate. Um, they see that rising polarization happening um, in the, starting in the 90s to the 2000s, continuing polarization of how the members of Congress vote. One of the sorting dynamics that's happened that has um, that might be part of increasing polarization is the Southern Democrats who were at this time in this era um, Democrats and then uh, many of them that were more conservative shifted to become Republicans in the 90s and so you see maybe part of the self-sorting happening as part of that difference of polarization in Congress as well. Southern, De Southern Democrats now mostly black. That's that's a good question. Um, let me. Uh, I would guess that would be the pattern. Yeah. Given what we saw on the other slides. Now here is now this is I thought a, a striking correlation. This is a strong correlation, and that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation but it's a striking correlation um, with um, the Gini index, which is a measure of inequality. Hmm. And what we've actually seen is as inequality has gone up, polarization has gone up. Mm -hmm. So it's a stronger difference of the Republicans voting um, differently um, than Democrats on issues. As, and that's, that and inequality have moved together. Uh, this, right? this, this is one of my favorites. The one I like is the version that goes back about a century because it's almost a U shape that from the New Deal up until, say, Reaganomics, there's a low level of inequality and a low level of polarization. But on either end, if you go back to like the turn of the century, the 1920s, you see extremely high inequality, inequality extremely yeah. high polarization. polarization. And you often hear people say that we are now in a period of such, a, we haven't seen such high inequality since the 1920s. So, and so that's interesting that the correlation goes um, in that, that pattern as well, in the other direction as well. So uh, it's a striking correlation. Yes. And you can think of uh, stories of, of, about why that's the case. Um, and uh, we talk about, you can have, um, as you have greater inequality, um, the parties um, becoming more diverse. And here's another interesting correlation, a little lower correlation, but this goes back to 1879. Correlation between the percent foreign born and um, house polarization. And you see stronger polarization as the percent foreign born has, has increased. Would it be interesting to see a comparison between uh, this chart and the previous one? In other words, uh, do, do, do immigrant, immigrants come into the country poor and increase inequality? I think the inequality, well, the inequality is strong enough, I think it goes beyond that. But. Mm -hmm. not, yeah, the only, yeah. immigration wouldn't be the only cause, but yeah. I'm just saying the in, large numbers of immigrants, Clouding especially in the 1920s, when they, when they were uh, mm -hmm. from poor, from southern and eastern Europe, poorer countries. <laughs> so, I see I've I mean, I have enjoyed looking at these patterns with you. Um, uh, I have on the slides um, some different places where you can go to see predictions. We've got really two prediction um, sources that are that people reference the most. Um, 538 um, is really um, Nate Silver has got had a reputation for being. Um, 
accurate, and so he has a good reputation for the whatever whatever magic sauce he uses in predicting, um, being able to do it well. Until 2016. Until 2016. <laughs> so, and again, then we come back to this question of whether or not um, we're going to have, uh, whether, whether politics has changed or not. I'm trying to get down to. I'm not sure we generic battle battle. Oh, hit escape. Sue, hit escape. If you want to oh. get to the, your. Uh, So a generic ballot is when you ask people just if if you had a choice between a Democrat and a Republican candidate, who would you vote for? And so it gives a sense of the feel of the public about between Democrats and Republicans. But again, they're voting on and sometimes voting with them for an incumbent. Um, but this still gives you a, a sense of the public's um, pulse on that. And this is um, five thirty. This is five thirty eight. What Real Clear, Clear Politics does is it is famous for taking all kinds of polls and giving you the, an average of what all these other polls have found. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're known for, for any of their predictions. Yeah. And so um, it's, you can see what there um, is a plus seven for Democrats, and you can see how the different polls compare. Oh, oh snap. <laughs> Something went wrong. <laughs> so here is quickly 538's um, prediction for the House. Six and seven chance the Democrats will win control, and one and seven chance the Republicans will keep control. You see there the opposite prediction for the Senate in 538. Yep. For the, the reasons that we've talked about. Yep. And in terms of governors, I think it's an interesting way to present those predictions. 59% of the population will have a, a Republican governor, 41% will have a, excuse me, Democrat governor, 41% of the population will have a Republican governor. Um, but if you, put this, if you see the states, there are fewer states that have Democrat governors, but more population that has Democrat governors. So that's just a few, uh, just want to show you those sites, so you can keep an eye on those sites, 538 and Real Clear are two sites to keep looking at different predictions. You can look up different races, but I'm going to stop there because um, I, I've appreciated this time talking about these patterns and predictions with you. Um, and I want to respect your time as well. And, and in terms of um, letting you get about your business, um, and, um, and that's the last slide I have too. So, for coincidence. <laughs> Many questions during. Or do you have a little time to take some questions or no? I can try. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you can take a few questions if anyone has them. Yes. I have, I have a question about um, given that you, for your day job, right. are sorting and relying and, and investigating various data sources, okay? Are you finding your confidence in some of these traditional data sources being changed over time? I'm, I'm looking at the data sources that historically for the last 80 years or so, for example, have been based on telephone polling. I don't think telephone polling is legitimate anymore because we've trained our populace to ignore robocalls. And so you've got, you're really self-selecting down to a not a very good representative sample of people who actually I think the, that's a huge challenge with polling, mm -hmm. uh, because people used to answer the telephone. Right. And so and, I'm wondering And how, there are fewer landlines. Yeah. So one, I'm, I'm and looking, then now, so at, the response to fewer landlines was to develop systems to get cell numbers. Right. And so now I think they're less uh, reliant upon um, land, uh, landlines, so you have less of the landline bias, but then still you have so many people who just simply don't answer the phone. Right, and so and, my question and so that is, so that, so that makes it less reliable. Yeah. 
yeah, because you have a lower response rate and more self-selection in terms of who actually responds. Right. So what we try to do in um, from your in, perspective, in how are science, you dealing with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from a political science perspective, the one one of the ways that you deal with that is you try to look at the patterns of who did respond, and then you see what are the patterns of who did respond, and then you put weights in your analysis to make up for the fact that. They're like, let's say fewer millennials responded. Mm -hmm. And so you put weights on the millennials that did respond to try to sh shore up um, what it would look like if you actually had the same number of millennials in your sample as you had um, in the whole group. But as you, that assumes that those millennials who answered are similar to the other millennials, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah. And um, so in terms of people answering polling, and again, I think it's a, it's a, a shifting politics as well. And what will be interesting to see, as somebody said, 538 was very accurate until 2016. So it'll be interesting to see you know, what happens in this election. It's a different response as well. Somebody in the back. Yeah, that, that kind of goes back to my question was, was going to about the general, the, the generic uh, ballot. Uh -huh. Does that, is that just blue and red, or does it take into consideration, uh, it doesn't look like it, it, from there, but like libertarian, No, it's just, yeah, it's just Democrat and Republican. It's just the two? Right. Okay. I could have looked it up in the mm -hmm. line. Oh, that's all right. Okay. And so this shows that over time, <coughs> yeah. the future. Okay. I don't recall if it was six or seven percent, but one of the many news forum broadcast I listened to said that the gerrymandering gives the, the Republicans about a 6% wipeout rate, that they would have to have a 6% bias toward the total voters for Democrats to win the majority of the House of Representatives because of the gerrymandering districts. So the Republicans were very strategic in 2010 mm -hmm. in terms of state legislative races, yes. and, and they had a, a strategy to win state legislative races to shape districting in 2011. Was that the Tea Party very, year? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was also, it also, when, when it was that year when we saw at the very beginning of the slides, we saw it was a year that many Republicans, uh, excuse me, many Democrats lost their seat mm -hmm. in that same election. And again, I think um, it was Tea Party mobilization, very much so, and anti Affordable Care Act mobilization right after the Affordable Care Act had passed. Mm -hmm. And so even state legislators found their races being dominated by that question about the Affordable Care Act and, um, and they fear and concern about it at that time. So all that really came together to give Republicans and state legislatures a, a, a majority in many of the states. And so that, is really, that then shaped the lines that we saw in states, um, including our own. Um, so. Do you have a suggestion for a fair method of drawing lines for districts? <laughs> <laughs> so, personally, mm -hmm. I think that um, in independent commissions mm -hmm. uh, are more likely to be able to draw fair lines than um, when it's done entirely by a legislature. But also, um, another way, another path to try to create the fair lines is to um, require that the maps be drawn um, by like legislative research office. And that's partly what um, um, Iowa does as well. And even if, if you don't have an independent commission, if you can require the maps be drawn um, on a neutral computer, and not allow people to come in with their own specialized consultant maps and a man <laughs> specialized consultant map. Um, it's part, part of making it more fair is that you set up the program to not allow it to consider some other some of those factors like who's been winning in the past. Um, yes. A comment on mobilization. Two days ago, we got an eight and a half by a letter at our house from the office of impeach the president, and it was addressed not to us, but to our son, who hasn't lived in Nebraska for 15 years. 
And when you think about it, I mean, we're, we're more likely to vote and we're less, our age group is less likely to want to impeach. And his age group is more. less likely to vote and more likely to favor impeachment. Yeah, I, that's interesting hypothesis. I, I, I don't know if I've seen data on impeaching, impeachment attitudes per age, um, but that's an interesting hypothesis there. Yes. Uh, have you seen uh, what sort of data has like, come out since uh, Citizens United and the, like, we've seen such an influx of money in the politics? Super fast. Um, I didn't bring any of that tonight. Um, the simple answer is there's a whole heck of a lot more money in the races um, than before. And um, um, I can't say anything much more intelligent than that at this point without having uh, more data or empirical evidence to talk about that in front of me. Is that, is that true on both sides? Both mm -hmm. Yeah, so more money, right. Yeah. And, both, and both sides have mobilized money. Not sure if this is in your area of expertise, but is there anything in the works to try to do anything about the problem we seem to be having with Secretary of State's being in charge of campaigns? Like we're seeing in That's Georgia and we saw in 2000. Right, right. That's a political problem more than a um, uh, than a political science answer that we can come up with, um, because it is an elected official, it is an elected position, and the party, whatever party is in charge, you would expect, from a political science perspective, you'd expect them to have some incentive um, to um, use that position. Um, and what you're so. I don't think that I have a good answer on what can be done about that situation. Um, well, but you do see, but you, it, it's holding people accountable um, and trying to, and hoping that there's a it, sense of it, like fairness. A nonpartisan position. Right. <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting idea, that it would be a nonpartisan position. Um, it, it'd be difficult. What we um, so just as somebody who holds a nonpartisan position, um, it would it does make it does make a difference in a body that we have a nonpartisan legislature, and in part that's because we aren't organized by party in the body itself, um, and so we don't have party caucuses, and the parties don't determine who gets chair positions and who gets on committees. There are different dynamics to those decisions than happen in Congress and every other state where the party shapes those things. But people still um, have party identifications and the parties still play a role in mobilizing votes for people. So a single position, you know, Secretary of State, um, it would be interesting to make it nonpartisan. It would still probably still be um, held by someone who had a party affiliation and might have party incentives. Well, join me again in thanking